So I am here to talk with you all about web accessibility, which I feel like is not really talked about a lot in DevOps, but is extremely important. So I'm really, really excited to talk to you about it. All right, so just to warn you all, I have a lot of really corny memes on here because in the accessibility field, we joke a lot about how everyone just thinks about alt text when it comes to accessibility. So one of the things that I like to do is try to create the alt text for memes because it's really, really hard. But I'm not gonna do that today because I don't have enough time, but I want you to think about how you would caption these because it's kind of fun. All right, so just a little bit about me. I'm an occupational therapist. I've been doing that for about eight years. I specialize in assistive technology and digital accessibility. I work with people with physical, mental, and emotional injuries and disorders. I actually no longer do that anymore. I work in tech. Um, I contract with the federal government, specifically the VA. I'm a community taught web developer, so I pretty much worked with other developers and learned how to code. So that's how I went down the rabbit hole with web accessibility. Um, like I said, I'm working full time as a 508 auditor, um, accessibility engineer. And I've worked with people with disabilities since 2010. All right, so here are a few of the, the key questions that I would like all of you to be able to answer by the time we're out of here. First, I want you to understand what web accessibility is, who's impacted by inaccessible web applications, when and how you should incorporate these accessibility in your projects, and some of the tools that you can use to get started with these things. All right, before I get started, this is a safe space, everyone. So you don't have to answer this question, but out of curiosity, how many of you all have a disability? That's a hard one to answer, okay. How many of you know someone with a disability? Probably all of us know someone, right? How many of you all wear glasses or contacts? You have a disability. I know it doesn't seem like it, but it really is one. And I bring that up to say that many people don't think about disability in those terms. They think about someone in a wheelchair, someone who's deaf or blind, things like that. And it's like, nah, we actually have to think about everyone, right? One of the things I hear a lot is the users, my target users, don't have disabilities. And to me, I'm just like, well, how do you know, right? I'm standing here, I look, all right, right? Do you know if I have a disability? No. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I do. And it impacts the way that I, you know, peruse the web. So let's talk about it. All right, so web accessibility is pretty much making web pages usable for everyone, including people with disabilities. So we wanna make sure that our web pages can be used by people with permanent disabilities, with temporary disabilities, so those are things like people who had an accident, who injured themselves, and people with situational impairments. And we're gonna talk about all of those things. We also wanna make sure that whatever software we're creating or building or website, whatever, is able to be used with assistive technology, which we'll also talk about. All right, so why should we care? Pretty big question. We should care because many different people are using our web applications, our web pages. Um, like I said, people say my users are not disabled. Well, you really don't know because 20% of people have a disability and half of those disabilities are silent. So that means you really can't tell, you don't know. And like many of us in the crowd, we're not gonna tell you. So while I have <laughs> disclosed that I have a disability, in general, I don't tell anyone. I don't really ask for accommodations at work and I don't bring it up. Another thing that I like to talk about is how much money you're leaving on the table when you don't think about people with disabilities. And the number is $480 billion. Um, this is something you can Google. Um, this is something they talked about in 2018. I don't remember my source, but it's a real number. <laughs> um, so this number is so high because the disabled community is extremely loyal, they have money to spend, and they will tell all of their friends in the community about any application or software that is usable for them, and then they will stick with you. So having this large amount of people, this big population, 20% of us, right, um, is something that we don't wanna walk away from. Because if I'm coming on your page and I can't use it with my assistive technology, or I'm overwhelmed once I get on your page, I'm bouncing immediately and never coming back. 
All right, some of us are also using assistive technology, so we're interacting with these pages in alternate ways. Some of us may be using like a screen reader, which reads what's on the screen. Some of us are using speech to text um, and things like that. Also, people may not be using a mouse. So when we're thinking about people who are not using a mouse, we're thinking about people who may have cognitive impairments or physical impairments, and the only thing they're using to navigate is a keyboard. So one thing that I want you all to do when you leave here is go on whatever you're working on, whatever website or software you're working on, and don't use your mouse. Only use your keyboard and see whether or not you can actually navigate through these pages, and I promise you the answer is probably no, because I myself, as a web developer who has built things before learning this, I go to all my old projects and I'm like, oh, I'm embarrassed. I can't use this with a keyboard. All right, so people may also not be able to see your screen, so those are the people who are using things like screen readers. And one thing I'll say about screen readers is people assume that if you're using a screen reader, you must be blind, and people who are not blind use a screen reader. Um, usually for people who have cognitive delays, brain injuries, um, or can't read very fast, they'll use a screen reader. Um, they may not be able to hear what's on your website, so we're thinking about captions and things like that. Um, and like I said, they may be using other software that makes using your website easier. All right, so people may be of able body of mind, like many of us in this room, but there are still situations where using a web page can be harder due to situational impairments. I really like this, um, this picture because it does a really good job of showing what permanent, temporary, and situational impairments may look like. So an example of that would be, I'm in a loud environment, I can't hear anything, but there's a video playing. So if I can't hear anything and there's a video playing, what should I have that would help me? Captions, right? Um, I'm outside using my laptop. There is a huge glare on the screen and I can't really see it. I can't really see it because my contrast ratios are too low, right? So that's something we don't really think about, but it's something really important, especially for like the 80% of people in here who are wearing glasses or who may be wearing contacts or have low vision. Um, there may be things like vision procedures that make you, um, that impact your vision in some way. Um, you may be using your hand to do something else. You may be on a phone with one hand, holding a baby with one hand, and now you can only use whatever you're doing with one hand, which impacts um, the usability of what you're using. All right, so let's get really, really, really specific about the users that we're talking about and how we can help. All right, so when we're thinking about physical injuries, we're thinking about things like broken bones, muscle weakness, tremors, stiffness, all these things impact how I'm kind of using my computer or my phone, right? So they may have low reaction time. So we're thinking about things that require a time limit maybe, thinking about time limits and thinking about um, using a keyboard and not using a mouse. They may be hearing impaired. So we're thinking about people who are hard of hearing or deaf, having those captions and alerts, low vision, having magnifiers, screen readers. Um, and one thing I like to talk about is astigmatism. Raise your hand if you have astigmatism. A lot of us have astigmatism. I think it's one in three people, right? So one thing that we as developers really love, we love dark mode. It makes us feel cool, blah, blah, blah. When I was learning how to code, um, everything was in dark mode just because that's what, that's what we like, right? But I've always used light mode just because that's what I like. Um, but as I was learning, whenever I would use dark mode, I would get these crazy headaches. I would also get really overwhelmed and not want to stay on the page or use my IDE, like whatever I was using to code because it was so dark. Then I did a little research and I realized this, this is something to think about, um, that dark mode is actually harder to read when you have astigmatism due to how that light hits your eyes. Once I skipped over back to white mode, suddenly I had no more headaches, I could see more clearly, and it felt better to use the page. So I bring that up because if you have dark mode on your pages, there should be a toggle at the top somewhere so that people can put it back to light mode or put it to dark mode if they want. Um, and that's something that is missing on a lot of web pages. All right, so these are some little corny memes. We're not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna go through them. 
but we're gonna talk about neurodivergence and cognitive delays as, as part of who benefits. All right, so when we're talking about cognitive delays, we're talking about brain injuries, learning disabilities, reading disabilities, things like that. Um, when we're thinking about cognitive delays, here's a, some of the things that we wanna do for our web pages are, we wanna make our website copy simple to read and to follow, and that can be hard sometimes, especially when it comes to things like documentation. Um, <laughs> when we write documentation, we're usually writing it for the developer audience for the most part, right? Or for the people who are using our things. And what I've noticed and what all of my good friends have noticed is it's really hard to get through that documentation. It's because we're using a lot of jargon, we're using a lot of acronyms and assuming that people know what these acronyms mean when they may not. Um, we have a block of text and it's just like a wall of text that you have to read with no white space no bullet points, no nothing. These are all things to consider as you're building your pages. Another thing to think about is directions. Are my directions easy to follow? Can someone look at this direction who's not a developer or not you know, within this sphere and actually follow the directions? And are my directions actually explicit? So if I have a form, right, and I need to fill in the form and put in the date, put in my name, put in all these things, does the form instruction tell the person how to use the form correctly, right? So if I need digits where it's like two digits for the number or whatever, you know, whatever, however the format, is that explicit? Most of the time it's not, and that can be confusing. All right, let's talk about neurodivergent individuals. That has been kind of like a buzzword as of late. A lot of us, especially us millennials, are neurodivergent in some way. Um, so when we talk about neurodivergence, we're talking about sensory sensitivities, epilepsy, dyslexia, ADHD, autism. Um, and when we're thinking about this population, one, some of the things that we should consider are whether or not we have moving, blinking, or uh, scrolling components on our page. These are extremely distracting. Um, me personally, if I see anything like that, I'm just like, uh, I'm out. <laughs> um, and we've gotten pretty good, I think, at um, not having those on our pages, but I still see a lot of that happening. Um, also, anything that starts automatically and doesn't give you the option to pause it. So that could be a video, that could be music, it could be anything. It needs, within the first three elements, I need to be able to stop it and then get to what it, where I need to go. Um, we kind of talked about white space, bolding, and bullet points. Um, just make things easy to flow through, right? If I look at a, at a block of text, I'm just like, I'm not reading all of that, right? But if I see it laid out nicely with the bullet points and with some spaces in between, my brain is like, oh, this looks great. I can read it now. So these are just little things to think about. All right. so. Who else, did I miss anybody? Do you guys think that anyone else benefits from um, just accessibility in general? No, I, I got everybody? All right, cool. All right, who else benefits? Literally everyone else. We all benefit because if I'm making my web page easier to use for one population, it's easier to use for all of us. So no one, no one loses if we do web accessibility, right? <laughs> It benefits everyone. Okay, so this is a great question. How do I start? I don't have this written, but I will say the first start would be start at the beginning because as I'm sure many of you know, um, it's hard to start at the end because then someone's testing your page and you have like 30 different defects that you have to now go back in and then redo and you're gonna break your whole page, and then because you gotta fix this, something else breaks, and it becomes this like million dollar problem, right? Very expensive. But first, you need to understand the core principles of web accessibility. We'll talk about it. So we're talking about like Section 508, which is a federal law, um, and the WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. These are kind of like some guidelines that are international that Section 508 directly follows. We need to understand what assistive technology is and kind of how it works with our technology. Um, and then we'll talk about these critical accessibility issues for web pages. 
Then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about how to test your pages manually and some of the automated tools that can help. All right, let's talk a little bit about the core principles. Um, these are things that if you know them, you'll have a pretty good start. All right, so our core web accessibility principles are your web pages, your software should be perceivable. I should be able to see it in some way, right? I should be able to operate it. I should be able to understand it. And it should be robust. And that just means it works across all environments, all different types of technology. Um, and before we get started, I'll throw out a random thing, which is that many people, oh, it's so tragic, many people are still using Internet Explorer, and many people have poor internet um, connectivity. So all the cute little things you're doing with React and all these components that are doing all these cool things, many people can't even see it anyways. So think about that and think about the fact that if their web page isn't loading all of these cool things, they still need this core information that you're gonna give them. So how are you gonna give that to them, right? So when it comes to perceivable, um, perceivable for me means I can see it, but for the people who cannot see, they should be able to perceive it in a different way, right? So they should be able to get that information through hearing it or touching it or seeing it. They should be able to get that information somehow. Should be operable. So that means it needs to be compatible with a keyboard or a mouse. You know what, actually, if you leave here with nothing else, please leave here with this. It needs to be compatible with a keyboard only. <laughs> It needs to be understandable, so easy to comprehend. We kind of talked about making your copy a little bit more easier to read and things like that. And then robust. Like I said, it works with assistive technology, looks good on mobile devices, and works with old browsers. Um, so in order to kind of wrap your head around all of this, you have to kind of understand the web accessibility laws and guidelines. Um, through Section 508 and the WCAG. So this is what I do all day. I kind of look at these guidelines um, and then test web pages before they get through to the government and then I give my stamp of, of approval whether or not they pass or not. Um, the WCAG documents explain how to make web content more accessible for people with disabilities. If you're interested in learning more, just Google it. It's super boring and very technical. Um, but at the end, I will give you some resources that will make it less so. <laughs> Uh, Section 508 is that web accessibility law that specifically dictates um, that we need to make pages that are accessible for people with disabilities. And it directly follows the WCAG. So if you understand these, I don't know, there's like 42 guidelines or something. If you understand them, then you understand web accessibility. The good thing is if you're here, you're probably pretty smart and either know how to code or understand a lot of different systems. So this should not be rocket science. It's one of those things where it's like, if you hear it once, you kind of know it. Um, and then just to say for, for when it comes to Section 508 and things like that, um, many people have this misconception that only things, only government uh, websites and things that work with the government need to be compliant. However, anyone can sue you. There's actually a group going around suing specific companies, going on your webpage being like, I can't use this, and then you get sued for a couple million. Um, Target was recently sued for like 10 million, I don't know. Beyonce got sued, y'all. Um, <laughs> Domino's got sued. Um, there's this group of <laughs> lawyers who go after anime websites and sue them over and over again. Like they'll fix their website and then get sued again because they found something else. So it's not just government websites that need this, it's also your websites. All right, let's talk a little bit about assistive technology. Um, assistive technology is any piece of equipment or software that improves functional independence, specifically with um, the use of digital like computers or anything like that. Um, it goes from low-tech things like maybe a pencil grip or Velcro um, to very high-tech things like speech recognition and like this really cool um, high-tech wheelchair. 
When we talk about assistive technology in general, we're usually talking about screen readers in this context because that's what a lot of people use. We're also talking about things like switches. So this is for people who are maybe only using the keyboard and may have like some type of dexterity issue where they can't use a mouse and they're literally just tapping um, like a switch or something like that to select things on the screen. Um, also talking about um, really interesting keyboards, um, speech to text, all this other things. All these things need to work with whatever you're building. And then remember, not only blind people use screen readers. All right, let's talk about the critical accessibility issues. These are the areas that we start with. Keyboard access and focus. We talked about keyboard access. Um, one other big thing is if I am a keyboard only user, I use the tab button usually or the arrow buttons to kind of navigate through the websites. And what I've noticed as a, as a tester who tests all day is the main thing that goes off in that area is your focus, like your tab focus may just skip all over the place, right? So that's something to consider. Um, like I said before, auto updating and auto, auto playing and auto updating content. These are things that need to, you need to be able to pause it and it needs to be able to speak to the user that it's happening. So this is why testing with a screen reader specifically is so important. You can use something like NVDA. This is open source, it's free. Um, and it takes maybe like, I don't know, five or 10 minutes to kind of learn how to use it. And then once you test with the screen reader on, you can kind of hear whether or not the screen reader is actively portraying what's on your screen. If you're not testing with the screen reader, you're not testing at all. So every interactive element should be selectable by the keyboard. And you shouldn't get trapped. So that's another thing that happens. I may be tabbing, and then I get trapped within three elements. And now I can't navigate anywhere else. Another thing that happens, and this is like one of my projects has this problem, um, like embarrassed, but uh, we have these hamburger menus, right? Hamburger menus, we all love them. Um, but most of the time, not most of the time, a lot of the time, I can't tab into the hamburger menu and then open it. It just stays closed. And I'm like, well, now I can't use it if I am a keyboard user. Um, flashing content, just don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> all right, let's talk about a little bit more. Alt text on images. Um, yeah, that's really basic, but like, <laughs> Uh, we want to make sure that when we put alt text in images, um, one thing that companies are getting in trouble with is they put jokes in the alt text instead of explaining what's in them, um, which is kind of messed up because it's like, well, what, what's in the image? It's not for jokes. Me, myself, I'm a big joker. I'm a big joker. So when I do memes and stuff or I do like reaction pictures, I make it a joke, but I explicitly explain what's in there, right? The purpose is to explain and not make it very wordy. Because remember, if we're thinking about people who are using screen readers, they have to listen to that thing drone on all day. If you have a paragraph under that, it's just annoying. <laughs> um, another thing, use a contrast checker to make sure your contrast ratios are good. Um, this is one of the main things that I see happens a lot, uh, especially with the designers. Designers get really, really into, you know, <laughs> their vision on how a page should look or whoever has this vision on how it should look. And then when you get to the testing part, your tester tells you this is like not good, right? And, and now you have to reconfigure your whole website so that people can actually use it. If you did that at the beginning, then it wouldn't be such a huge headache. Um, one other thing, uh, make sure your web pages can be zoomed in far. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but some people zoom your page in like 2,000% so that they can see word for word. Um, but just make sure it's able to be zoomed in for 400% and then your page doesn't need to be like scrolled to the left and the right. Also, don't use color or images to convey messages without alternatives. One in 12 men are colorblind. Enough said, right? So if you have anything on your page that requires color to understand or instructions where it's like, pick the red ball or pick the red whatever, a lot of people can't see the color red. Um, and also make your links explicit in where they take you. So 
if you have a link and it says click here, um, that's not great because if someone's using like a screen reader or something and they're looking at a list of links, they're just gonna see click here and not really know where it's taking them, which is kind of annoying. All right, let's talk about manual and automated testing tools. We all know AI is like this whole thing now, right? <laughs> um, and that also includes for web accessibility. Um, so what do you need to test? You need a good understanding of HTML, specifically semantic HTML, a little bit of CSS, JavaScript does help. Um, we need a keyboard to test for keyboard access. We need a screen reader of some type. I already told you NVDA is free. Um, a web page magnifier, which should be in your browser already. Some type of color contrast checker, you can Google that. I, as a Mac user, I like to use something called contrast with an E at the end. It's really fun to use. Um, a browser accessibility checker, let's talk about those. Um, I like to use Axe DevTools by, De by DQ, or DEC, however you say it. I also like to use Wave Web Ames Accessibility Checker and Lighthouse, which is under the Google DevTools that also shows you the accessibility um, tree that shows you what a screen reader would read. Usually I go deeper into this, but I don't have any time for that. Oh, so when we talk about these browser accessibility checkers, if you leave here with anything, here's another thing to leave with. They will only find like 20% of whatever's going on with your page. So even if you use Axe Tools or Wave or whatever, and it says you have 10 defects, you fix all those 10 defects, I guarantee you, absolutely guarantee you, there are like five more that you will catch just by tabbing through and using your keyboard um, or using a screen reader. So those two things, no one ever does, and that's why when you take your thing to go get, you take your project to get tested by a professional, they're like, oh, well, actually, right? So these are just things to think about. So like I said, automated tools, they're awesome. They give you a visual of like what may be going on, but at the end of the day, they're not enough. You need to manually test your pages. You need to tab through the websites with the keyboard and do all the things we already talked about, right? Making sure that your headings are semantically structured, you have your H1s, your H2s, things like that. Um, checking for those contrast ratios, oops. And I'll just leave this up if anyone wants to take a picture really quick, but if you do these things at the beginning, it's so much more easier because you don't have to think about it at the end. So if you're planning already, plan with these things in mind, and you won't have this $200,000 problem at the end. Um, just to share a small little anecdote, as a tester, um, we often test really big projects that are coming in from different tech companies, and these tech companies are spending a lot of money, we're spending a lot of money as a government to um, kind of get these projects. Recently, a project, because they didn't do all of this, um, they were, were rejected, and the cost of that rejection was $20 million. It's a lot of money. All right, so if you wanna learn more, I have a YouTube page where I do a lot of different trainings on web accessibility and the WCAG and all that other stuff. So if you want to learn more, um, what many people do is they'll watch uh, one of the one hour ones and then share it with their team. You watch one of these and you'll know how to test and do all, this, all of these things pretty easily in one sitting. So you can find me on YouTube, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me on uh, LinkedIn. My name is Africa Bincy on LinkedIn and Africa Kenya with an H at the end everywhere else. Thank you so much, everyone.